I'm from Glasgow, you know. Got to get every last bit out, you know. Philip Johnston isn't your average care worker. He's worth £20 million and lives a luxurious life in Glasgow. Cheers, everybody. Good friends. But life for this multimillionaire was not always so fortunate. Having spent his life in foster care, he'll be going undercover looking for those working in care today. I was um, fostered from when I was six weeks old. Get you five. Yeah, right. He'll find out about charities working with kids going through the care system. What time do you guys normally go to bed at? Oh, about three, four o'clock in the morning. Yeah, <laughs> and meet people who've dedicated their life to the cause. My mother wasn't a bad person, she just had an addiction. And that's what I really, really struggled with. Sorry. That's good. While working alongside other carers, <laughs> Philip will meet those whose lives they change. Two, one, go! But he'll also hear about the issues they face. At two years of age, that child could tell you how to have sex how to take head away. As well as coming to terms with some of his own. Your mother must be a very, very proud Oof. woman. I'd love to meet her. <laughs> my indulgences in life are really my cars or my mates. Eh? That's a hairdresser's car. That's a midlife crisis car, you. But I love it. 43-year-old Philip Johnston lives in a million-pound mansion in Glasgow. I've got a whole bunch of guitars. Uh, I'm a big Queen fan, so I've got a, a, a Brian May replica guitar here that I got. This guitar here is signed by Wet Wet Wet, um, so being a, an 80s guy, I'm a big Wet 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 fan. Phil's wealth stems from one thing, his love of technology. I've been in the mobile phone business since 1985 um, when mobile phones were absolutely huge. How's you, mate? Good, you? We take mobile phones and we recycle them. You usually get that removed, those scratches, and take all the scratches yeah. out. Yeah. That's perfect. We've grown the company from zero to um, 20 million pounds over seven years. So yeah, very proud, very proud of it. Despite recently selling his company, Phil's family think that when it comes to money, he's proud to live up to the Scottish stereotype. If he can avoid paying anybody to fix something, he will. I've got to try and fix it because I don't want to pay some repaired guy to come in. <laughs> but I'm Scrooge. Oh, Scrooge? Oh, yeah, Definitely. Bit, man. Definitely. <laughs> you, Lee, do you play something? Phil may not splash out his cash needlessly, but when it comes to his sons, he doesn't hold back. Go, go, go. Yeah, be it. E, e. We're very close, we're more like friends. That's the fortunate thing about life and the success I've got, is I can support the boys with their dreams. One of the reasons Phil is so close to his boys is because his own start in life wasn't so fortunate. He was given up for fostering at six weeks old. He was a good wee boy, but between 15 years old and 18 years old, I'd have given them away. I would have paid them. These were, to these were just teenagers going crazy. My mum fostered me. I was six weeks old. She seen this newspaper, it was called The Glasgow Citizen, and it was a tiny little advert, and it said foster parents wanted, and she called the number, and that was it. Fostered into the Johnston clan. It was a council estate, it was, you know, a rough neighbourhood, but we were never short of love and my family were amazing. Unlike many children taken into the care system, Phil has remained with the same foster family all his life. What about the time I went to see Michael Bublé with you? And you pulled out red lacy knickers <laughs> to throw at him. I nearly died. I was so embarrassed. I was like, oh my God, put them away. I was sitting eating my milk teasers. But last year, Phil's foster mum, Nancy, was diagnosed with cancer. We were all devastated. She fought it and it went away, and then it came back aggressively within two months just this year. The prognosis says is that she's always going to have cancer and it'll always come back and we're always going to be fighting it. So I suppose, again, with success, what, what use is money? <laughs> this is my attempt at folding. With first-hand experience of the care system, Phil is curious to find out how it's changed over the last 40 years. What else do I need? Um, 
Chris! Yeah. Any chance of giving us a hand? I no. love that t-shirt. No. Uh, a bit pampered, actually, to be honest with you. Phil's going to Swansea, where over the last decade there's been a 55% increase in children taken into care. Here, he'll look for and be introduced to people working within the care system who may need his help. How you doing, mate? Where are we going? Town Hill, please. OK. What's Town Hill like? There's drugs. Very famous for uh, car theft and what have you. A lot of issues, eh? A lot of issues. It's got a lot of issues, yeah. Once the heart of Welsh copper mining, the loss of heavy industry has led to economic decline and high unemployment. Any particular areas I should avoid? All of it. You got a beer bottle? Someone knew I was going. The moment of truth. Ah. Yeah, look at the big stain in the carpet. I think someone was shot here. This is a crime scene. A wee scout around the neighbourhood. A wee look around. How you doing, pal? Hello. All right. Where's the shops? Nah. Down there? OK. See you later. He's going to fall now, yes? <laughs> He's going to fall, mate. <laughs> What's the script here, guys? What? What's going on around here? Nothing. Mm -hmm. We come to have a nose. Where's this on TV at? Yeah? I think, I don't know. I think it's on in the, the summer. It's a documentary. I was uh, fostered in Glasgow. I grew up in a council estate like this. So, what is it to do around here then, guys? Football. Football and walk around the street. That's it? Shit. Bored. No. Nothing yet. Me. Do you live here? No, I've just moved in. Just down off Gorse Road. Oh, yeah, we know that. Yeah. We live in a shit hole. <laughs> Yeah, that's murder. That's just trouble waiting to happen. Just boredom. What are you going to do? You're 14, you're, your head's not wired straight. You're going to be standing around there just wondering what mischief you can get up to, aren't you? I'd find it really, really tough to see my boys hanging around in corners like that um, with nothing to do. So, uh, yeah, I'd be absolutely gutted, to be honest with you.
No heating, no gas, no hot water, cold shower, cold bath. Millionaire businessman Philip Johnston is living undercover in Swansea. He was fostered as a baby, and with the number of children taken into care at a record high, he wants to find out about the issues they face today. Can you stick a tenner in it? Hey! We have fire! Fire! I'm reading an article about the Roots Foundation. The founder was in the care system herself and in foster homes because of, of her parents' alcoholism and neglect and abuse. As it glided up and up, Chloe saw her house... Emma Lewis set Street up the Roots Foundation and just over a year ago. And the charity now supports 12 children in a pioneering scheme, Kinship Care. Philip has asked to meet with Emma as part of a documentary he's making looking into the care system. Well done. How you doing, folks? Is Emma around? Hello. Hello, Emma. You must be Philip. How are you doing? Fine, nice to meet you. How are you? you I'm too. very good, eh? Good, good, good. It's a little bit hectic and they're very excitable. I can see that. It looks very excitable, yeah. Can I ask you to do something really boring? Can yes. I ask you to sign in for me? I love his accent. You love his accent? <laughs> Tell me a little bit about what goes on here. Uh, the Roots Foundation, we work with young people in care, young people leaving care, young people in kinship care, which isn't something that people really talk about. It's generally people who uh, live in an alternative family lifestyle, maybe with their grandparents, with their aunties or their uncles, but they need support as a foster carer would do, um, as, you know, as anyone would do looking after young yeah. people. 52-year-old Kim has fostered her grandson, Corey. When she works nights, she drops him off at Roots. Corey! Oh, fabulous, you're doing a good job, fella. Before we start cooking, what should we do before we start? Wash your hands. Go and wash your hands, everyone, for me! Yeah! Is it this way? How's the cheese coming down? Today, Emma is giving these kinship carers a break and teaching the kids valuable life skills. Have you just made lasagna before? Yeah. Neither have being in the care system myself, I identified that people still need help. I, for a long time, only knew how to cook a vegetable soup and added, like, half a pot of salt into it. Are you crying already? We've yeah. just started. Oh, God. Do this. Put your wrist under there. It stops you crying. We took them down to the supermarket yesterday and said, we need to think about ingredients, incorporating vegetables and meat and learning how to cook them and having fun, really. Missed a bit there, Jack. Hold on. Hold on. Wait a minute. <laughs> I'm from Glasgow, you know. Got to get every last bit out, you know. So what is your passion about the care system? Um, I was um, fostered from when I was six weeks old. And then six weeks became six months, became, you know, my entire life for my mum. So social services looked after me. and But I don't feel like I was in care. I was with a family and the same family all my life. And I was very lucky. But the, who normally does all the cooking? With the, with the apron. Do you think we should ask her to come in and be our secret weapon and help us? Shani? What? No one knows how to cook lasagna. Right. When Shani isn't giving cooking advice, she's running the Tea Forest Community Centre, which houses Roots and several other local charities. And then pass that cheese. There's hot in there. We'll stick it in the mid middle shelf, is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. Right. What do you think? Spot on. It ties in very much with some of those life skills that people need Looking when they're just thrust into a, the adult world in a house for the first time. So, yeah, amazing. It smells nice. Oh, right. You would think you were in Italy, wouldn't you? And you smell that. Yeah. Yeah. We'll be on Friday, so you want to come again? Everyone say bye to Phil. Bye, bye. 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 Emma's quite amazing. Motivation. Her story's um, fantastic. She's doing something about it and, yeah, and amazing. I'm homemaking here now, taking the National Flower of Wales. Hopefully it stays alive and gives me loads of good luck. Phil has read about a charity offering supported living to young adults leaving the care system. Basically a supported housing project but we do get quite a lot of referrals of uh, young people that have had a, a history of being in care. What's your motivation yeah. for, for being involved? Well, I, I've, I've been in care myself. Um, before, well, I was, in, I was fostered. I was fostered all my life, so... Okay. I, it would be good to if you come down and have a look at the project. Really. The Wallach offers a safe haven to young homeless people. Housing 11 supervised flats, 
It helps young adults make the transition to independent living. There is a vacancy, so she keeps a roof over her head. Paul Sheridan has been managing the project for 10 years. He's on call 24 hours a day, and he's always on hand for support, often acting as a valuable father figure. How are you doing, Paul? Right, Pleased to meet you. All right, come in, mate. Thanks very much. Government responsibility for fostered children ends at 18. Hi, everybody. How are you doing? The Wallach helps those not yet ready to live unsupported. We welcome volunteers. We couldn't do what we do without volunteers. Yeah. You know, they add to it. But then that gives you experience and we get, yeah. you know, extra um, time and uh, input from other people. That's brilliant. Yeah. And especially if you've got personal experience of things, that gives you a little bit of understanding what some of the young people go through. It's brilliant. Yeah. Shall we go and have a chat? You've got 12 flats or something in total? It's a, 11 self-contained flats and one plus one emergency bed, yeah. yeah. And everyone that comes here, do they get a place? Is there enough capacity? No, we've usually got people waiting to come in. Yeah. We cannot meet all the need all the time. They come with a range of things. It could well be that they've um, left care. Um, Behavioural issues. What um, age when you say young? 16 to 25. But to be quite honest, I think we're getting more and more 16 to 17 year olds. In at the deep end, Phil has been asked to help cover the night shift with experienced project worker Sean. Do you like Thai curry? Actually, I do. Oh, lovely, thank you. So, what time do you guys normally go to bed at? Oh, about 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, it's all good. Do you know Philip's doing a sleep in shift tonight? Oh. You're all going to bed early, aren't you? 4 o'clock is early. Yeah. And then 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock's late. Is it? Thanks very much. Thanks for having me. <laughs> the Wallach team is always looking for ways to help the young people express themselves. Tonight, Sean is helping with a music project. It's based on the cycle of homelessness. So it's really walking through the streets, trying to get a job, and then finally coming to the project here and being given a home. Hannah's pretty good on the song now, but we need to work out some harmonies for it. Yeah. 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 I can certainly play the guitar on it. Um, yeah. Who are you going to get to do harmonies? Um, the girls here. Yeah. Oh, you haven't heard my voice yet, have you? <laughs> Phil settles in for his first night shift. We've got the CCTV here, which yeah. basically covers the outside of the project and um, inside as well. I think really the ethos and, you know, hopefully what you get a hang of tonight is the project is here for the young people. They're not here for us. Yeah. So yeah. it's us that have got to be adaptable and flexible. Though there are limits. Turning down. Oh, that's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Turn it down. Yeah. Thank you. It's been a very quiet night tonight. I've looked at all the cameras and there's not a lot going on. Just what kind of problems do you get? What kind people have of... been drinking alcohol. We may have some people who've been upset. And we've had people who've self-harmed before. Um, so there's been overdoses here before as well, but we haven't got any people with bad substance misuse here at the moment. Um, but they know if, if there's an emergency, they come down to knock us and then we'll either ring the emergency services or if we can deal with it ourselves, we'll do it ourselves then. Home sweet home for the night. Morning to you, how are you? How did it go? Ah, it was brilliant. I thought we were going to be up to three and four in the morning partying, like I would have been. <laughs> it's not just a safe haven, it's actually some phenomenal life skills, to be honest with you. Um, and I know they're teenagers and they'll kick off, and I know they're no angels, right? Because they are. And I know they do all the things every teenager does. But do you know what? There's, there's a backbone there. Absolutely phenomenal, I'm blown away. Phil is interested in meeting charities working in the care system, but a story in the local paper has caught his eye. Margaret and Tony Davis are fundraising to pay for their daughter's cancer treatment and may have to sell their home. I'm going to give a call to um, the parents of Tina. My mum's already fighting cancer just now for the second time. 
So it's going to open up. Um, it's quite a tough, tough one for me. Yeah. OK. Yeah. You got it? 40-year-old mum of four, Tina, has been diagnosed with a terminal brain tumour. Uh, how do you feel, Tina? How do you think of this blue bell? Yeah. Now, her daily care falls to Margaret, her 70-year-old mum. Yeah, it's lovely now. Margaret spends any spare time she has fundraising for a potentially life-saving treatment for Tina. Yeah, now the weather's here, we'll have another bike ride because it was really enjoyable, wasn't it? It was for you, wasn't it? Wasn't it? Hello, I'm looking for Tony. Hi. Do you want to come sit down here, Bill? Yeah, sure. All right. Hi, Margaret. Hi, Hi, Margaret. Hi, pleased to meet you. Pleased to meet you, Margaret. Are you Welsh? <laughs> I've got a Welsh accent, haven't I? <laughs> a nice Glasgow accent. Right. Tina's parents, Tony and Margaret, are continually looking for new ideas to help them reach their £30,000 target. Research on the internet and we found this hospital in Paris that did this um, fibre optic procedure. We will choose a whole head and they go with a fibre optic wand and they destroy the tumour. We raised just over £14,000 on our target of £30,000 for Tina's treatment. Tried to sell the house and, as I said, the house is only bricks and water. It didn't matter, really. Where did you raise the, the 15,000 that you've raised so um, far from? Mainly door-to-door -door sponsorship. Yeah. Margaret's been heavily involved in that. Yes, knocking doors. Talking about doing some abseiling from a tower block. That was Margaret's suggestion. Oh. Um, Cooks has come up with a good idea of a pub crawling fancy dress <laughs> with a bucket collection sort of thing. So, would you have any ideas? Barbecues are always good. Yeah. You enjoy yeah. barbecues. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. You could have a night in here, you know, where you got a band or somebody to just play. Yeah, we... You'd play live yeah. and... We and think we've, got we've already... Yeah. We've got one, yeah. All the stuff he's doing sounds amazing. Your daughter's very lucky. You know, to have amazing people all, an amazing support network, you know. My mum was diagnosed um, over a year ago with um, womb cancer. So I can sympathise and understand exactly, you know, what you're going through. He'd, he'd never give up, you know. Mm. I think the next event now is going to be you a skydive, Margaret. Oh. <laughs> well, I am petrified of heights. Yeah. I am, really. Yeah. Yeah, really. You're the bravest woman I've ever met. <laughs> She's looking for a brave man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's the lengths you do, you go to, you no. know. Perhaps you'd uh, like to join me. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> She's very persuasive, isn't she? Uh, yes, yes, I am. Yeah. That's yeah. how she gets her sponsors. <laughs> Well, thank you for coming in. Margaret also uses her persuasive skills to get Phil out looking for sponsorship. What do you think? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hiya, Dad. Right. Yeah. All right. All yeah. right. Um, I'm sponsoring us for skydive for right, Tina's yes. uh, friends. Yes. Oh, okay. Down. Okay. Would you like right. to put your? Yeah. Give me the money there. All right. Okay. Thank you. Well, Don't forget that. It's for Tina at the end of the day. Mm, I'm well, doing yes. for Tina. That's you know? what it's all about, isn't it? Yeah. Can't do any more than what you're doing for her. No, no. So, I can't really. I'll see you before you go Saturday. I hope so, Dad. <laughs> I hope so. Thank okay. you. There we are. Okay, nice, nice, to, meet nice to meet you all. Nice to meet you. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Dad. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. Take care. You're doing all the amazing things. You're doing an amazing thing. I just don't want to lose her. Yeah. I felt you useless. I want you to just reach over and just take Margaret's pen when we're going round the doors and just sit here down, just put that down right now and let's just, just stop this, will we? And the first thought on her back to She should have just maybe been in the house, sent her feet up. Uh -huh, yeah. Yep, you happened to her daughter, but she's not. She's out banging down doors and she's been doing it since October. I love you so much. I do it time and time again if I have to for you. I never really got to know very much about Emma and the team at the Roots Foundation, what they do, how many kids, you know, they're supporting in the community. I know very little. 
Today, Emma has organised a play session for grandparents who foster their grandchildren. It's a chance to bond with fellow carers. It's kind of an unsung situation because um, grandparents often feel like it's their duty. They don't think of it as being anything, something other than what's expected of them. Yeah. So they go through life, bringing up their grandchildren as their children and doing a fantastic job, but also need support as anyone else does, you know? Grandparents such as Kim, who's fostered her seven-year-old grandson. <laughs> Cody just told me that he couldn't Swing a swing. You can't swing, swing a swing. No. So, Kim, how did you start looking after Cory? My son couldn't look after him because he was an heroin addict, as well as his mother was a heroin addict. Two years of age he was when he came to me, and at two years of age, that child could tell.